Thank you for tuning in to this sermon podcast from Redeeming Hope. We exist as a family of faith that follows Jesus and helps others find him by living all of life as missionaries of hope. If you want more information about our church or would like to support our ministry, go to our website at redeeminghope.org. Please enjoy this sermon podcast. Well, hey, good to see you all again. Um, and you're probably wondering, what do you mean again? I think I was here uh, maybe last summer. Uh, but my name is Marshall Gallagher. I'm the pastor of Hope Community Church in Nashville. I've uh, known Josh for quite a while. been getting to know Derek for a couple years, too. So it's been wonderful to kind of see uh, y'all's church plant uh, grow and kind of be here and then uh, be with uh, Josh and now Derek and kind of us all joining together in the gospel. Um, and I'm excited to be here. I'm, I love that I can help out the two of them have a break. Uh, and I hope that y'all uh, just encourage them uh, to get regular breaks too. Uh, because the I, I just came off a month of not preaching at our church and had other people kind of help. And Josh was a part of that. And it really is refreshing. And I think uh, not just for the preacher, but that's really what the congregation benefits from the most is a refreshed preacher. Uh, so whenever you can find times to help uh, the two of them or any other teachers that, that come uh, do that, and really it's kind of like this reciprocal blessing. The more you pour into them, the more y'all will get out of it. Um, but this morning, let me pray for us, and then we'll kind of jump into the word this morning. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, uh, open our ears, our hearts to hear from your word, uh, that even when your word is uh, a hard word, that it would uh, break through uh, and give us peace. Uh, and so, Lord, we pray that you would do that this morning. Uh, and we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Um, all right, so I want to start with just a question. Do you see Jesus as offensive? As offensive? And I don't mean just as kind of the, oh, well, he presses against our selfishness. No, I, I like offensive, not, not mean, not mean-spirited, uh, but he, he does offend. And we're going to read a chapter where he intentionally offends, uh, not it, probably in the way we describe it. Of course, he's, he's sinless, he's, he's perfect, and, you know, maybe there's this temptation to be like, oh, well, if Jesus says offensive things, I guess I have a green light. And it's like, no, 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 he's, he's perfect, all right? So... But that's what he does. Uh, you should see him as offensive. I think if we never are offensive or, or kind of pressured or put off a little bit by what Jesus says, it might be an indication that we're not really hearing what he says. Um, but so in, in John 6, uh, I, you may, if you've been around church for a, a while, you've probably heard of Jesus referring to himself as the bread of life. Uh, that's John 6, and John 6 is a huge chapter. We're going to look at the second half of it, and there is so much here. Uh, there's eternal life. There is kind of election and how we're drawn to God and these big theological concepts. There's the Trinity. Uh, there's Christology, which just means what we believe about Jesus and who he says he is. Um, there's Bible history, there's tradition, there is this big, thick teaching on the Lord's Supper or communion or the Eucharist and lots of theological debate inside this chapter. Um, but I also think with all those big topics, it could probably be broken out into like a six week series of Bible study. Uh, there's kind of one point and it really is that Jesus is the bread of life. He, he just, uh, Jesus just got done talking to uh, these crowds. It was right after the feeding of the 5,000. Remember where this small, you know, this boy has these fish and loaves and Jesus has everybody sit down and all the gospel writers record this miracle. He multiplies it and then he starts talking to the crowds. They uh, follow him across the sea and, and they're kind of looking after him and Jesus is like, you're just looking for stuff. You, you ate the loaves, you had your fill, you're just looking for stuff and, and you just want the next satisfaction of kind of the things that you think will make you happy. And then he says, but I'm the one. You're looking for stability in what I can give you in your life. He's saying, I'm your stability. You're looking in just provision on a daily basis. I'm actually the one you're looking for. And, and he's just gotten done uh, talking to this crowd, trying to kind of get this message through their head that it's not the stuff Jesus can do in your life 
that will make you happy or, or really give you true life or give you peace. But it's, it's Jesus himself is the one who does that. And so now he kind of transitions to the second half, um, but he starts with, and the people are like, sir, give us this bread always. And, and here's where he answers. Um, but right before we read kind of the first half of the passage, I think that main, main point he is trying to get across uh, is not only that you've got to find your source in me, he goes a step further. And was, this is where he starts really pressing it and offending almost everyone he's talking to is he says, and, and if you don't find your source of life in me, it's not just that you're not gonna be happy, it's that you aren't alive. That if you don't have your source of life in me, if you don't find everything you're looking for in me, you're actually without life. And, and so that's that second step of offense. And so if, if you're a note taker and you wanna kind of write it down, I would say only those whose source of life uh, is Jesus will truly live. Only those whose source of life is Jesus will truly live. And we're just gonna ask two questions. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean source of life? What does that even look like? And then uh, secondly, what is it like to find your life in Jesus? And so that's what we're gonna do. Let's read that first half. Uh, keep your Bibles out though, because uh, I'll read the first half, talk about it, and then we'll kind of read the second half and talk about it. Uh, but let me read the uh, John 6 starting in verse 35. So Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but, to the, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who, should, who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is, this, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the father except he who is from God. He has seen the father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh." The Jews then disputed among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. So I don't know if you're like, what in the world was that? Uh, but again, only those whose source of life is Jesus will truly live. So, so what does that source of life mean? I think he, uh, there are two kind of uh, maybe categories. I think John, the gospel writer, is drawing out. Um, and one, it's this kind of relationally functional life that we're invited into. Um, it, it's relational, but it's, it's functional. 
And so, you know, I, you may share with me, I, the, when I think of a functional life or functional family, I'm like, okay, well, either your parents are together or they're divor- divorced. And when I was growing up, it was like, you have a dysfunctional family. That was thrown around all the time. And I'm, I'm more in this category. I think that those categories might be a little old and maybe uh, too wooden, but functional. It's like, okay, is it operating in the way it was meant to be? Uh, And we're invited into this relationally functional life between the father and the son. And then a little bit later in the passage, the spirit is brought up too. And John is just kind of dropping these hints slowly throughout this whole kind of story uh, that he writes through the gospel and really highlighting uh, the role of the father, the role of the son, the role of the spirit and how they're kind of working together. But if you look kind of closely at the passage, you'll see a couple things that the father is doing. Uh, The father sends the son. Uh, The father gives, verse 37, all the father gives me will come to me. Um, A little bit later, it says that uh, the prophet said that all will be taught by the father. So the father is revealing and teaching. um, And then the father is granting, uh, verse 40, this is the will of the father, my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes should have eternal life. So he's, he's pointing to the son. So you see this beautiful picture of God the father uh, saying, look at the son, look at the son, look at the son, and sending the son to go do something. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and it's like, spoiler alert, like that's Jesus and he's going to die, right? Um, I'm not trying to kind of be coy, uh, but you see the son, uh, Jesus talks a lot about, hey, I am being sent by my father. I, I'm the one, I'm coming from the one who sent me. Uh, and so there is this rich following of the will of the father by Jesus, of of kind of being this obedient uh, in the best of ways son to do the will of the father, to go after who he has sent him to. Um, And then you see in the son that the, uh, one of his major things that Jesus talks about is his his role. And it's kind of weird because he's talking about himself in the third person right? He's saying, well, the son is going to do this. The son is going to do, do this. Uh, he's not saying, I, and I do this. Um, but he's talking about the son. So uh, it's not my own will. He's not, fathering his, he's not following his own will uh, in this first little section of, of 35 to 40. Um, he's saying, I should lose nothing, verse 39, nothing of all that he has given me, um, but raise it up on the last day. And so you even see some of those operational things that he is doing where he's not losing any, he is following the father's will. He's raising them all up on the last day. uh, And that's really one of his major roles. And Jesus repeats a lot of it. Uh, in kind of 52 to 59, he's saying, whoever feeds on my flesh has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Whoever feeds on my flesh uh, abides in me. And because I live, because the father sent me and I live because of the father, uh, he will also live because of me. And so basically Jesus is revealing this idea Uh, that is uh, highlighted in John 6. It's not the only place in the Bible, but this idea that uh, God is drawing people to him. He has some and he he will not lose those who are his. Uh, And if you've been in church for a long time, this is one of those big sticky kind of arguey areas. uh, And it's either called election or uh, you can talk about Calvinism, Arminianism and uh, Wesleyanism and uh, doctrines of grace and all these different words and all these different things. I I think in heaven, we will be much closer than we are today in how we argue about it. Uh, But uh, two things I want to at least highlight is neither group, uh, and there's, and some of y'all are like, what is he even talking about? And honestly, I'd rather keep you there because the further you get down into this rabbit hole, (laughs) usually the messier it gets. Uh, But it's really, how do you come to salvation? And then like, how do you, how do you keep or lose salvation? So I'm, you may have heard like once saved, always saved or you, you don't fall away. So, so those are two different descriptions. What I would say is that neither side believes uh, that it's just up to us alone. 
And it's a little comforting because, you know, my card's on the table. I'm more on the kind of doctrines of grace, Calvinism, reform side of it, if you know what those words mean, where I'd say, well, yeah, it's this, it's this uh, irresistible grace that washes upon us, and then we are now open our eyes to draw to the Father and all that stuff. But the other side doesn't believe that it's just this volitional decision that comes out of nowhere, right? They still believe that it's the Holy Spirit drawing them near. So again, we're a little closer than we like to describe, uh, but as a simple kind of way of describing it, and maybe you've thought this is, this is really big, and it is big. Um, it's highlighted here. How I described it to my 10-year-old is basically this idea of what happens to us and how does salvation work? And then how does this idea of Jesus keeping us and the Father drawing us? Uh, it's kind of like we are out in the middle of the ocean in a life raft and it's a janky life raft, right? It's, it's and, and maybe it's one of those like inflatable unicorn things and we were in the ocean and we just weren't paying attention and we just let ourselves drift and drift and drift away. And now we're miles, we can't see the shore and we only have ourselves to blame. We're out in the middle of nowhere and we don't know where to go or get back. Jesus comes in in this rescue chopper, comes down, picks our sorry you know what's up and is pulling us out of the water and we're just grateful he's here to rescue us. And, and what I like to say is, is what always say, you know, uh, once saved always says, or perseverance of the saints, what that means is it doesn't matter how hard I hit at his arm to try to get out of his grasp, he's not letting go. I'm not being rescued because of something I did, I'm being rescued because of what he did, and it doesn't matter how I behave, what I do afterwards, I'm not strong enough to break his grip. And when it's described that way, you may have people on the other side now saying, well, maybe I might explain it this way, which is fine. But you know what that's not gonna do? That idea of Jesus rescuing us and us not being too strong to break his grip of our souls, it's not gonna be weaponized against people. We ought to just find comfort and assurance and, and just glory and, and gratitude in the son that he has come and gotten us. And you know, it's the father that drawed us in anyway. And Jesus went and came and rescued us. And we can just say, oh my gosh, thank you. I can't believe this. Let me tell you about how lost I was, how hopeless I was. And now I found Jesus and, and his strength is the one that keeps me. And so that's this kind of huge doctrine Doctrine is just short for kind of what we think about things, what we believe about things, but that's all here. This is one of the biggest chapters in the Bible that people point to. And if that's even more confusing, there's this quote of Augustine that I think is really helpful that ties it together. It says, this revealing, the father revealing himself, uh, is itself the drawing for what does the soul more strongly desire than the truth? And so, it's, so, so we're, we're, we're yearning, we're yearning, we're yearning, and the Father is drawing us in. And that's really these operations of the Son and the Father working together that Jesus is describing in this kind of relational life that we are invited into. Uh, but it has a purpose. It has a purpose of eternal life. In verse 40, and I'm sure you heard it multiple times throughout, it is, for this is the will of Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life life. And I mean, John has mentioned eternal life over and over and over again, and you're kind of getting sick of him mentioning it because Jesus is bringing up all the time, but that's, he's just hammering in on that main purpose. So with even all that doctrine and you're like, gosh, that is just really big and heady. Jesus boils it back down to, but here's the point. It's that he would grant eternal life to all who believe in him. And John even says towards the end of his gospel, this is so that you would believe. He's writing this whole book so that you would believe and you would have life in Jesus, eternal life. And the crowd picks up on it and they don't like it. In verse 41, it says the Jews grumbled. And that's kind of a sneaky word that John wrote in there to kind of take us back. If you know the Old Testament, it's like they were grumbling about the Lord all the time in the Exodus and they were like, can't we go back into slavery? I used to have nice cakes. And Moses was like, what are you talking about? So it's the same grumble. And I know I, I grumble all the time. I don't know about you, I grumble a lot. But so they were grumbling, it says, uh, 
that because, because Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And so there was this theological idea that they would not know where the Messiah came from. And, and then Jesus said he came down from heaven. They're like, well, this is Joseph's boy. We know where he's from. He's, he didn't come down from heaven. We know his parents. And what, what, why, how, could, how dare you say that? And so their big objection is the divinity of Jesus. You can't, you can't have come down from heaven. We know your parents. And so there was no kind of idea of the virgin birth and this miraculous kind of conception thing. And uh, they are unwilling to accept that Jesus is God. That's their biggest issue right now that they're kind of responding to. Um, and it's a big question for us. If, if you read any of the gospels, you can't really walk away just thinking Jesus was a good person. He does not allow that. And, and that ought to offend us. We can't just say, well, Jesus was a great teacher and he was a good man. Maybe the best man that ever lived. He was a great example. Jesus doesn't allow you to put him in that category. Because he's either, C.S. Lewis used to talk about this, either liar, lunatic, or Lord. So he's either lying to you. He is not who he says he is. He's either insane, he's crazy because he's saying all this stuff about how he's the son of God and all this stuff. If you're gonna take his word seriously, if you think he's a good person, no good person says the things that Jesus does if he is not, in that third category, well, I guess for y'all it would be this, right? No, it's that, uh, Lord, right? That third L is Lord, liar, lunatic, or Lord. So it, you can't just keep him as a good person. And, and they picked up on this. Uh, they, they don't like the idea of Jesus being God, and that, that's a central offensive notion to us. Um, but that whole eternal life thing that Jesus is talking about expands from there, and that's really what his response was because he doubles down. He says, verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And he says again, I am the bread of life. And then he goes in for kind of the kill shot here. He goes, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. So now he's, now he's getting into their history. Now he's getting into their dirty laundry kind of stuff. And he's speaking right to the heart of what they're wondering about. And he said that they ate that bread and they died. If you eat the bread that is me, you will live forever. And he says, the, I give uh, for the life of the world is my flesh. And so that's kind of the second really offensive thing that Jesus knows what he's saying. He's going right, right in their backyard and mentioning kind of their, uh, their wilderness experience, uh, their heritage, their history, their tradition. And the people pick up on it and they are even more angry. Verse 52, it says, and they disputed amongst themselves. Then they're really mad. He says, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? What is he talking about? Uh, you are not, so, so that's partly Jesus is mentioning the history of the manna in the wilderness. And then he goes into like the law. You are not supposed to eat animals with their blood in it, especially not cannibalism. So, so Jesus is bringing up these things. He knows that he's gonna be pushing on everyone's kind of uh, tradition and history and some of it's mixed in with the Bible, some of it's mixed in with kind of how they do things as a society. And it's kind of this way that I think we often get trapped in here and I'll, I'll call it traditionalism where it's like history and religion and social mores, uh, it, all kind of uh, mixed together and we calcify it. And, and basically, and I'm, I'm getting old enough to where I look down at the generation before and I just feel this coming on me where I'm like, these kids today, and we all do it. And I mean, e even for us who are at like the, the, the older generations, they said that about, the, you know, their grandparents complained about the young kids and you were, you were the Gen Zers at one point and I, the millennials have gotten all this mess. And then what is it, Gen Alpha, we got a couple of them in here. Who knows what y'all are gonna do? And I'll, but I'll be the old geezer being like, I can't believe these kids and their Fortnite dances and all that. That's what, that's what we do. And we just, so we start to bring up little uh, positive good things of the past uh, we start to bring up even religion, even good, you know, biblical stuff. But then we start kind of mixing it with, 
history and it becomes our ideology where, where we want to get back then. And I mean, that's a lot of the rhetoric today is look at the country now. We should get back then. And I always think about my mom uh, when she was little during like the Cuban Missile Crisis where like they learned how to do uh, drills in case there was a nuclear attack where they would hide under these little desks. And it's like, it's a nuclear bomb. <laughs> like, it's not like an earthquake, like one of these ceilings would come and you don't want to get hit in the head. It's like, you're hiding under a desk and takes a bomb go. Like, and, and so we now are like all these kids with their drills and I can't believe they have to do active shooter training things. And like that, yes, that is something we ought to work for and correct and, and eliminate and, and grieve. But back then in the good old days when you're hiding under a desk because a nuclear bomb might go off in school like that when we look at it and zoom back it's like going back to the good old days when like we're here and that's what they that's what they were really holding on to that's what made them miss Jesus is they were so focused when they had it all good and if you look at the Bible history and the tradition and all that, you can ask that same question. When was it all good? When was it all good? For very tiny, just blips in history. But if you know the kind of big story of the Old Testament, the whole story is God yanking his people out of trouble. And I mean, that's kind of our life too, right? It's God yanking us out of trouble to try to bring us into this promised land, whether it's spiritual or literal, and that's what Jesus wants to kind of break up is this, I want to push you out of your categories. He knew that mentioning you have to eat my flesh would freak them out. And that's what it did. He wants to dislodge them uh, so that they can hear about eternal life. And so again, like what is this source of life? It's, it's this relational kind of functional operative life with the Father, Son, and the Spirit that's already going on. We're invited into it. And then it's eternal life. It's eternal life with kind of Jesus as the center consumption of your singular devotion. And he's saying, you come to me and you will have everything you need. You will live forever and you, will, you can stop spiritually toiling, spiritually working and exhausting yourself. That's the source of life he's talking about. And so kind of secondly, all right, well, if that's what he's talking about, that's what we're invited into that. If we kind of consume him, then we'll find life. And only those who do will truly live. What does it look like? Like, how do we do it? And, and so I just want to read kind of the response of, of not the Jews, but his disciples, like the people who were with him, the church folks. Here's, here's what they said, verse 60, if you want to kind of look back. This is after he finished teaching. It says, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Um, so first we see these disciples responding um, and their response to Jesus uh, is a little troubling. I mean, first they literally say, this is offensive. This is too much for us. And, and their response is, especially after Jesus kind of brings up this idea uh, of the Lord's Supper communion um, and John's writing it in because his readers would have noticed these small Christian communities uh, talking about eating the flesh of their God and eat, drinking the blood of their God. And actually in the first century, like all the other people in the community thought that they were maybe cannibals because they would talk about like eating flesh and drinking blood. And John, so John's writing this in because he's writing to people who didn't really understand for the purpose of them to believe. And so he's kind of writing this explanation of kind of this is what it means, this is what it comes from. Jesus mentioned this years, you know, a year before we would have even practiced it. 
Uh, And here's a little hint as to what it means, but this idea of eating flesh and drinking blood, it was too much for many of his disciples. It was too much for what felt normal to them. And so they said, this is offensive. And then Jesus kind of gets to the core, uh, at least the core concept of, look, it's, it's not about the flesh. It's not about the blood. And again, this is one of those topics that people will study and study and study. And what is the communion? When it, are you actually ingesting? What, what's happening with spiritual thing? But I think the core behind it all is, and we'll, we'll celebrate this in just a moment. The core concept is this is not some kind of magical spiritual pill that you take to get everything you need. When Jesus says the flesh is of no help at all, he's saying these material things, that's not what gets it. It's, it's It's about feasting on him, the spirit, it's the life that you find in him. And so uh, the, the table is a very serious thing, but maybe not for the reason that you think of immediately. Like you ought to reflect, um, but it's not, have I done well enough to get up here? It's not, am I, am I sorry enough for what I did this past weekend to get up here? Uh, it, it's more of a declaration. It's more of saying, no, 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 I, I know all the things I want. I know all the tempting things, whether it's money or status or control or comfort or my kids kind of growing up to what I wish they would be or my parents finally telling me what I wish that I would hear. It's, it's none of that. It's saying, I know that there can be momentary good from those things, but I know that ultimately my only good, the only place I can land is Jesus. And that's the single place that I can find all of that. And it, and it is him. It's not what he can do for me in my life. It is him. And so when you reflect, it's not to reflect about your behavior or if you've been good enough or any of that. It is that you are reflecting on what direction you are choosing volitionally saying, okay, I'm going to turn and reject all those tempting things and turn and declare once again by walking up here and and taking the bread and the cup, I'm declaring again where I find my source of life. And and so John's bringing this up and that's a huge way of like, how do you find your source of life? It's these practical rhythms, right? And and so there is something profoundly spiritual happening, but sometimes I'll just be honest, I don't feel it. But I, but I come and I show up and I participate because I need many of y'all to remind me of this grace and this source of life that's there. And so, so much, especially when I was younger, I thought, oh, coming to church, that's so lame and every single week and all this stuff. So much, and, and probably many of y'all who have been in church for a long time, just the rhythm of getting together with other saints and being reminded is a massive part of partaking in that life with Jesus, even when you don't feel like it. Um, And so that's really what he talks about is this source of life, this is a proclamation of what it is. Uh, And so I just wanna encourage you, just show up. Show up and be honest. And that is one of the best gifts you can give this entire room, whether it's a small group or a big gathering, just show up and be honest and be honest kind of repeating these rhythms with one another is so much of a way um, of doing that because that's what, it's practicing what Jesus loves. He loves the church. He loves when kind of two or more are gathered. He loves this. And so practice what he loves. That is one of the best ways of kind of uh, how you find your life in Jesus is getting around others who find their life in Jesus. And so I'll kind of close with this idea. And it's this last section. It's at verse 66. It says, after this, so this is after, after Jesus said all this, it says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and we and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. 
Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12? And yet one of you is the devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. And so there's two things that happen here. Peter gives kind of his answer that I think describes so much of, of life with Jesus, just a messy, normal life following Jesus. Um, and then Jesus answered and it's, and it's weird. He, he says, well, did I not choose you? And so like, why would he do that? It almost seems like he's kind of smacking them on the head as they are like, well, he, they're sticking around. What? But what Jesus wants to do is he wants to make sure that we don't, that his disciples, his 12, his close ones, don't let pride get in the middle of this whole idea about following him. He wants to remind them, hey, at, at your core, the reason these people are walking away, it's, it's because they're turning toward uh, traditionalism of how things were and how things should be and all this stuff, or they're turning toward this divinity problem with Jesus. You, I, I, I'm too close, I'm too familiar with this whole God thing. You can't really be all that you say you are. Or it's his other large group of disciples that it's just too much. Socially and, and their sensibilities, it would be too much. Jesus wants to remind them that, all of that is them trying to craft Jesus into who they want him to be. And Jesus wants to remind even his 12 who are sticking with him, he's the one who called them. He's the one who came to them. It, it didn't have to do with them. It's him. Even the, even the source to find the source of life is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And he's giving them this hard reminder, even when they are uh, coming to him. Uh, this uh, commentary uh, on this passage says, it's a strike to our pride that God would be the source and the acting agent of our salvation. We don't like that. We wanna know that we provided something. And Jesus says, I, I chose you. And so even with all this teaching, with all this, uh, these big concepts, all this stuff, I think it's, it is complex. There's a lot of complex teaching in here. And it reminds me when I was a teenager, uh, I was in Young Life camp and uh, I, I, you know, I basically went because there were cute girls there. I didn't care about God and all that, but I kind of grew up in the church, kind of not. And uh, we were kind of in one of the nights and all the guys, there were like 20 of us. And my leader, uh, Taylor, was going around saying, okay, let's just go around and say, do you believe in Jesus or not believe? And he said, do you believe? No, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes. He got to me and I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess, and he goes, there's no guessing. You either do or you don't. And then he moved on. And I was like, what the, like, why are you calling me out in front of everybody? And it, cause he didn't say a word to anyone else. And he called me out and I was like, what? And then he just kept moving. And I was like, and that question burned in my heart for six months. It was this wound by a guy I loved and trusted. And, and I was like, well, that, it stung. And it was true. And it was an offensive question and a hard question. And it got to the root of really what was down there. Did I believe or not believe? It is a black and white binary yes, no question that changed the course of my life. I don't think I'd be here if, that, if he didn't ask me that question and pause and challenge me with that kind of offensive thing. And that is what Jesus has done to his disciples. And it, it, there's all the theology and all this stuff, it's very complex, but there's a simplicity to it. And you hear it in Peter's answer. He says, where else are we gonna go? I believe and he probably thought in the back of his head, and yeah, that's, I don't understand all that stuff. But where else am I gonna go? And I think a lot of times we can, we can make it really complicated and really complex of how we follow Jesus and what we ought to do to pursue him and run after him and what we should know or not know and all these things when really it comes down to do you believe and saying, yeah, and you know what? I don't have any other options because I do know and I do believe. And so for better or worse, I'm sticking it out with you. And then Jesus reminds us again, which 
will wound our pride, but can be one of the most comforting things ever. He says, I chose you. And when we let that wash over us, we realize that he really has done everything required for us to be with him. And so that's what I mean. That's what I think John means when he says, only those whose source of life is Jesus will truly live. Let me pray for us. Lord, uh, help us pursue this life that you invite us into. And when we get overwhelmed or confused with all the, the depth of you, that we would just remember that it's simply, uh, do we believe? And in our belief, you have even drawn us to you and walked us up to that line and helped us cross it and been with us the entire time. You've rescued us, Lord. So help us, even when we don't know all the different ways of how things work and all the different thoughts of how we should believe or shouldn't believe, Lord, that it comes down to that simple question of where are we going to go? Where are we turning next? And, and help us continue to do that toward you, uh, wherever we are in this faith journey, Lord. Um, help us believe in you and, and keep us, uh, and we trust that you will. Amen. Thank you for listening. We gather every Sunday at the Clarksville area YMCA. For more information, please go to our website at redeeminghope.org.